Hey guys, apologies for the bad sound at the beginning of this episode. We'll be fixed next time. Alright guys, welcome back. Greg Everett, Ursula Garza, Weightlifting Life Podcast. I've forgotten to do this on the last several episodes. If you have questions that you would like us to potentially answer, you need to go to catalystathletics.com slash podcast. And there is a little thing there on the right side where you can ask a question. Um, So go ahead, submit your questions. And if they're really good and it's not something we've already talked about a million times, there's a good chance that they will get used. Uh, If you're looking for life insurance, which is a great idea if you know anybody in the world who's related to you and will probably outlive you. HealthIQ.com slash Catalyst. Uh, you can go take the little quiz to see if you're eligible. These guys are a actual health insurance agency. They're not just brokers. They'll take you through the whole process. They can get you better rates um, for being a healthy person who does things like weightlifting and strength training. Uh, so go check that out, healthiq.com slash Catalyst. Ursula. Yes. What's happening? Um, well, I still have a few slots open for my art of coaching weightlifting in uh, Black Box in Fort Worth, Texas. It's happening the 23rd, 24th, and 25th. We start around 6 p.m. Uh, on the evening of February 23rd, which is a Friday evening, and then we go all day Saturday, the 24th and the 25th. So that's coming up. Um, You're so it's, tired. I, it was Robin Bird Goad. You can take it up with her. Um, and then uh, March 15th, 6th, uh, 16th, 17th, 18th, I'll be in Houston at Brevera Weightlifting uh, doing the same thing, Art of Coaching Weightlifting Seminar. Um, we still have some slots open there as well. Uh, we have some. I have some interesting interesting things coming up. If you want to know, the the Fosh Cup follows right after. Um, or is happening about the same time as the Arnold. I know a lot of people are going to the Arnold, uh, which is functioning as a Pan Am team trial. So, good luck to all those people. Um, I think we'll have hopefully another podcast out before then. But uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, fingers crossed. But just in case, um, and and. Uh, uh, Derek and I are going to – he'll compete in the Fosh Cup, which is a, a recognized IWF Cup. This is um, in Iran, right? In Ahwaz, Iran. And um, I'm going to coach uh, a women's camp. Um, as most people know, the Iranian – well, I don't know if they know, but the Iranians have never had women compete in weightlifting because of uh, the religious cultural uh, restrictions – and so they have had asked me last year to come and work some with uh, with their women's team that they're trying to develop, and um, and so they asked me to come back this year, and and they're they're still at, uh, working on trying to get a women's team uh, started and developed, and so I'm gonna go and do that, and so that's that should be really interesting, and so I'm I, I'll be really kind of the first uh, woman to come in from outside um, and work with uh, women there. And, you know, with the restrictions there, the the men can't uh, coach the women, and so they run into some barriers. And so um, that's why they they asked me to come in um, considering... It's hard to start a women's program if you've never had a women's program and men can't coach the women. You don't have any women to coach the women. That's right. And so they, I do know that there is one woman that has uh, taken courses alongside um, the men, but she obviously wasn't a lifter. She couldn't have been. Yeah. And um, so they're, they're, they have asked me to become uh, the person who comes in and works with uh, that coach and their athletes to start the program rolling. And uh, Sally Vanderwater uh who's an official here in the U.S. is also going to accompany us uh, to start working to develop uh, female officials so that we can get them going so that they will be able to then run their own women's events at some point in the future um, because they will have to they'll have to run them separately. And I know a lot of people have 
you know, misgivings about this idea that the women and the men can't. But for me, it's just about giving the women the opportunity to be able to participate in the sport that I love, that I think brings so much more value to their lives. Um, and if we have to do it within the restrictions of their society and the, 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 the restrictions that their society has created and has, then you just do it, you know? Well, and it's a starting point. It's not going to be absolutely. perfect right out of the freaking gate. So at yeah. least, at least be happy with some sort of progress, and then right. I mean, I, it I we did it here, by the way, in the United States. I mean, the first women's world championships. Of course, men could coach and men could be there, but it was separate from the men. And that, that um, wasn't until like 1987 or something, right? Right. And yeah, it wasn't that long Olympics ago. Until 2000. Yeah. And our first nationals was separate from the men, and and you know there was. A lot of things, and it and and I'm going to tell you when we um, were incorporated with the men and had to compete alongside the men when we didn't have our own categories, we wanted to have our own categories and separate from the men. So it's all you have to keep things in perspective. I remember getting invited to a Junior Olympics to compete in the men's categories, and I was like, I don't want to compete with the men. I want we were fighting for our own separate categories. So I mean, you have to have some perspective in all of this. Um, and so they're, they're being given the opportunity to, and, and I really, uh, tried to express to, uh, President Ali Marati of the, their weightlifting federation, what a huge opportunity, um, he's affording. And, and it's not easy in their country to be the person that's saying, Hey, I want to do this for women in sports in this country, because that's not I mean once they hit a certain age it's it's gone from their from their lives and so um, it's gonna be um, I, I think for me it's it's quite overwhelming to be given that opportunity and in any case um, the the month of March is going to be filled for me so we're, we're gonna try to get some of these podcasts done because not only do we have that in March everybody wants to know what the weight classes are going to be and I, my answer, my stock answer has been, um, you, you're either in your weight class right now, or it's going to be above or below what you are. Um, <laughs> Got it. That's, <laughs> that's all I know. Um, you know what? Here's my thing. Why are you worrying about it? It's going to be what it is. Yes. You're not going to know what it is until it is. So just settle down. Like you, you're not going to plan for it. So why are you fretting about it, pulling your hair out, wringing your hands? Mm -hmm. And there are going to be, and obviously we're going to have 10 weight classes um, for, you know, world championships. And then we'll have to obviously 10 weight classes at all of our competitions nationally. But there will only be seven Olympic weight classes. So the only thing you can really hope for is that the weight class that you end up being in is an Olympic class. If you're in that group that can potentially make the Olympics. Um, I think that's the bigger deal. Well, and I think that's, that's why a lot, been doing a lot of people in wrestling for a while, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So it's it's and, doable, right? And some people end up having to move around once you know to try to make an Olympic team. But um, in March uh, we have well we have our USA Weightlifting Board of Directors meeting preceding the IWF Executive Board meetings, and I would expect that we might get the first whiffs of what might come out in June. Um, I'm not 100% sure because I haven't seen our agenda, but um, that would be, so people don't ask me before March, I don't know. And I'm not gonna start uh, bugging uh, people who are trying to work on it right now. We, we have been solicited, the, the national governing bodies have been asked to give their select, to give their, you know, suggestions and it's really funny because, you know, there was all of this, you know, back and forth on our board of directors about what the classes should be. And I was like, okay, everybody calm down. We are not creating the classes. Let's get this straight. Yeah. Like we are giving. Exactly. Why are like, you even we're just talking giving, about it? We're just giving suggestions. So they're all going to go to, um, but, it, but you could just tell from from this from the beginning like everybody thinks they have the right answer and if that's true of of, of our board that's going to be true of the executive board the the sports committee like everybody's going to think they have the answer and so I can see this um, being 
quite an interesting battle to see what the classes end up being. And I think that's why we have such, you know, such a big gap of time to settle in. Um, we did get some interesting data from Les Simonton and um, um, I'm forgetting his name, Meltzer. Is that who it is? Oh, Meltzer. Um, formula, the guy that did the that works on that formula. Yeah. Um, uh, so, like, mathematician type guys. Uh, and, and Les works in, with compu- in the computer. He's the one that always does competition secretary stuff and fixes everything. Um, and they gave us, at, at least we got, um, and this was really smart of Phil to, to gather this, um, a few years back of information on how many participants we had and and all of the different weight classes that we currently do have and uh so it shows you the spread of athletes and and how it thins out in the low classes and thins out in the top classes um i think that gives you like kind of the best information to work with and where when you have 10 classes you should be concentrating your efforts yeah to kind to kind of uh make sure that you have um, what would be really helpful is to know like the body weights of all of those people. But of course, those body weights would have been skewed based on what those body weight classes themselves were. Right. That doesn't really represent what they're yeah. walking around so, the weight is. Yeah. I mean, if you could get that information, that would be really, really helpful. Good um, luck. Yeah. But in any case, uh, I, I'm one of, uh, I'm, my my plan is to be more of a listener um, because I, I want to hear what all the ideas are. Uh, and, and I'm sure, you know, the proposals that do come forward are going to be very well discussed and thought out before they get to us. Uh, and I'm look and I'll be looking me in particular, I'll be looking for like what Les uh, brought us, which was, um, where is the where where is the research behind it? What are we what are we looking at? Right, um, instead of just some arbitrary new weights. Right, yeah. Where where is the logic and rationale and methodology used to d- to devise this new plan? And, and that's all you can really do. Um, so in any case, so March will be kind of exciting. Just got to get through February. Um, yeah, well, we're getting there. It's quick. Yeah. Right. It does. Everything's so been you had a couple topics, a couple questions that you got that mm-hmm. you wanted to address. And I, I did. I mean, so, some of these uh, questions are questions that people have it, it kind of come up repeatedly. And, and, you know, like just kind of walking around and, and during the courses that you teach, you get kind of some or with friends or acquaintances or whatever you get kind of some of the same inquiries over and over again and this is one that came up recently um the the gym owner that brought it to me asked not to be identified um but this is something that has actually affected me once and uh and i've seen it affect especially with crossfit gyms affect uh, people over and over and create a lot of bad feelings and contentiousness. And it, it actually applies to several different scenarios. But her, what her question, what, what she wanted me to address was how should an athlete or client properly and respectfully switch either gyms or coaches or clubs um, and I, when she asked me, I kind of laughed and I was like, yeah, um, even back in the day before there were a lot of gyms and coaches and clubs, we had a protocol in weightlifting that if you were going to switch coaches, the norm was for the two coaches to have a conversation about the athlete and agree that that athlete was going to move from one coach to another coach. That it was never just 
they, you know, would slink away from one coach in the middle of the night and then slink away, you know, move over to the other coach. It was always done. And the same with clubs. Uh, if somebody was going to change from um, Coffee's Gym to East Coast Gold, John Coffee and Leo Totten had a conversation that said, yes, we agree. And then the paperwork was done as well. Yeah, but you had now, to actually have an interaction. It's much easier now. Yeah, I mean, you had to have an interaction because paperwork had to be physically signed. But it was also a matter of respect between the two club owners and athletes were in some way forced then to have a conversation with the current club owner and their coach and the new club owner and the coach so that it was done in a manner that was um, respectful and uh, considerate of everyone in the situation it was it was very adult like even when you were dealing with younger athletes there was just this culture of doing things in a respectful manner that showed um some sort of consideration for all of the parties and everybody in the sport adhered to that but as the sport expanded Beyond that, and now granted, we were small, we all knew each other. But as the sport expanded, and you know, you had just you know hundreds of, of and thousands of people joining, the norms um, and the etiquette that existed in those norms has definitely been lost. And so, this you know, kind of behavior of being um, straightforward and honest and respectful. Kind of, I mean, that's one of the things that you do wish would have been maintained. And um, now you see, you know, and, and in a business, if someone's a client, they have a right to go wherever they want. And and if they want to compete for another club, they ab- absolutely have a right to go to another club. But you get this kind of shady behavior where someone's on a trip and the the coach for the trip which used to be against USAW rules and is against USAW rules that the coach for a USAW team can't solicit an athlete on that team that belongs to another club and coach they're not supposed to solicit that athlete to join their club and 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 for that coach to become their coach but it's happened it, and it, it keeps happening um, or even at a national championships, maybe the, the, the athlete is there and the coach for some reason isn't with their athlete 24-7 or isn't at, uh, with, you know, accompanying their athlete or the athlete goes and, and hangs out with another team and maybe their coach is a newer coach and a more experienced coach uh, starts to say, hey, why don't you come join our team and does something which is really fairly underhanded uh, and disrespectful of um, this newer coach that might be trying to uh, build his or her reputation and then just swipes this up and coming athlete um, out from underneath this new and developing coach. Completely inconsiderate and disrespectful. I mean, in my opinion, what should happen is this more um, experienced coach should reach out to the new coach and say, hey, you have a really talented athlete here. If there's anything I can help you do to develop this athlete, let me know. And maybe I, we would like for both of you to become part of our team. And I'll mentor you as a new and developing coach. He's your athlete. She's your athlete. And you can join our group. Um, if you want to stay independent from us, that's great. I'd love to help you develop your club. But that's not what happens. They just try to steal the athlete. And then when the athlete turns out to be not as good as they thought, they just kind of get lost in the mix. And now they don't have a coach and they don't have a club that cares about him. And they're just kind of floating around now. And it's, it's really, and I, you see these things happening and it's, a, it's really sad because people are just not acting like responsible uh, adults. They're just going around like fucking vultures. Um, and then you have the whole, you know, switching gym issue where you see uh, people just going in and telling 
one gym owner, oh, you know, I, I think I, you know, I'm injured or I don't, I don't feel like lifting anymore. And then, and then the next week they pop up at another club and they're training with another club and coach. Why did you have to lie? <laughs> There's no, just, I mean, be a fucking adult and say, hey, you know, I kind of don't like your style. I don't like you. I, I don't particularly like the way we do things. I um, don't like you. <laughs> I don't like you. I don't care for you. You're allowed you know, to say that. Absolutely. You don't have to like everybody. I certainly don't. You don't say. Shut up. And I don't expect everybody to like me. That's okay. Good you thing, can huh? <laughs> Yeah. It's perfectly fine. If you don't care for my personality or, I mean, I'm bound to rub somebody the wrong way. Jesus Christ. I can't believe I don't rub more people the wrong way. Seriously, you rub me the wrong way. No shit every fucking day. <laughs> Y'all, they didn't see us this morning. The fight before the fight. Um, so it's the. Well, uh, it just well, seems like silly that people just can't be adults I, and I be think, honest. It just I, goes so much further. Yeah, but there's a lot of different things going on. There's a lot of different situations. But I think that to keep it really simple, if you are a coach. There's nothing wrong with getting an athlete from another coach if it is that athlete's choice to come to you. If you are actively recruiting an athlete who is currently working with another coach, lifting for another team, and has not indicated to you previously in any way that they are looking to make a change, then you're the asshole in that situation. Mm-hmm. Um, you can be available, you can be welcoming, you can be encouraging, but you should not be actively recruiting lifters who are on other teams. And I don't think that's a, a really complex uh, ethical concept to wrap your head around. And I think that a lot of people know that that is true, which is why they're working behind the scenes to tr- you know try to not be seen poaching athletes. Now, if you're an athlete, like Ursula said, you have every right to train with whatever coach for whatever team that you want. You don't even have to have a good reason. You can do it on a whim. That is totally your choice. But if you want to be a, a decent person, all you have to do is tell someone, hey, this is what I'm going to do. See you later. You don't have to go and give them their whole life story and you know, why you're leaving or why you chose this particular coach, just tell them that you're doing it. And if your coach is a decent person, he or she is going to say, okay, bye. You know, they're not going to make a big deal. They're not going to make you feel guilty about it. They're not going to, uh, you know, disparage you all over social media and things like that. The only reason a, a, a decent person coach would get upset is if, like Ursula said, you're trying to do something kind of sneaky, uh, under the table. There's something else going on behind the scenes that you are trying to hide. You are being duplicitous for some reason. That's the only reason any decent person would get upset about that situation. doesn't mean they're not going to be bummed out that you're leaving if you're a great lifter. Uh, of course, any coach is going to be bummed out to lose a great lifter. Um, but, you know, if, like Ursula said, if we can all just kind of pretend to be adults periodically you get over it you understand that that's how things go people change teams athletes move around it happens all the time in every single sport in the world uh, but what you you know when you're in your own little kind of weightlifting bubble i think people forget that that is pretty normal and they look at it as some big scandalous exciting thing when really it's just kind of everyday mundane routine stuff yeah i mean people move jobs it's the same thing i mean moving from one a company to another changing jobs it's just, it, that's basically what's happening and it happens all the time in the world um, it's I think it's the it's the being shady and the shysty shit that becomes the question it's like why are they lying about it why did they were they not upfront about it what, what what was the motive that that caused it that's what then I think starts to create bad feelings well and if you're worried about hurting your coach's feelings by saying hey i don't want you to coach me anymore that's understandable but you need to understand that their feelings are going to be a lot more hurt 
if you're dishonest with them about it Absolutely. than if you're just up front. Everybody, so you're everybody. making it worse for everyone involved mm -hmm. by not being straightforward about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you have to remember also, if you're a coach jumper, that comes <laughs> Word that, that gets comes, out. <laughs> that's right. That, that, that comes with a reputation. Like it, just like if you're a coach that is it has a lot of turnover with athletes, that 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 reputation gets out. If you're a club that is a poacher who who tends to steal athletes from other, that word gets out. Like everybody, I mean, you start to develop reputations. Um, I don't I don't solicit for athletes. If, if somebody wants to lift our team, they basically have to come to us. What I will do is offer to help coaches who are developing athletes, um, but I will never then put my name down as the coach for that athlete. The athlete will remain under the, the coach that they have, and sometimes they'll actually for our team, sometimes they won't. Um, but I'll still, because I'm trying to develop a larger um, network of, of higher level athletes throughout our state, and so I want um, more capable coaches throughout the different areas of the state. Uh, and, some of, and, and almost everybody on my team has their own team because of that, um, because my main concern was to develop more capable coaches. Um, and in the meanwhile, I was able to develop a, a, a team. But that wasn't uh, the the main priority is to develop the sport overall throughout the state of Texas. The so you know it depends on what your goal is, what it's going to look like. But you know if you have, if you're an athlete that has had many many coaches, um, and you tend to blame the coaches you leave the coach or badmouth the coach. People are going to notice. Yeah, you're not fooling anybody. <laughs> no, you're not you, fooling anybody. You, if you're a decent lifter, you may fool your next coach if he or she is relatively inexperienced and not well connected in the in the community. But it will be temporary. Uh huh. And then well, you I have mean, a bad day, and it's suddenly the new coach's fault. Yeah. The the the. The, I, the best thing I can hear is when I get a, a new athlete and they come to me, and um. They talk about how how appreciative they were of their former coach. Then I know that they uh, are capable of developing the correct kind of uh, relationship with their coach. Like they didn't leave their uh, previous coach on bad terms, and they appreciated their coach. Yeah, that's a good that's a good sign. Yeah, like they they moved on for some reason other than tension with their former coach right and I try to make sure that anybody who who has left me as an athlete because I have sometimes co co uh, athletes uh, move out of state or something like that I try to put them in the hands of another good coach that I know out of state um, and and then we'll communicate hey I've got this athlete moving to your state and, and vice versa I get recommendations on that on that front and we yeah. all do that are that are that we that that are uh, coaches um, that are friends in this community. Um, we try to hand off the ones that are uh, good clients and, and hard workers uh, and good athletes, um, even if they're not the highest level. Uh, still, if we know that they're going to be a good fit in your gym and make the environment a positive one, we want to put them in another good environment. So you 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 your reputation goes with you. Yeah. Okay. So what was the next uh, question? The other one was, um, we get all of these Instagram thing, uh, posts. I see them all the time and they, they, there's always this like power snatch or power clean or nah little thing. And it always occurs to me, like my mind goes to, this is what Ursula thinks when she sees those, um, First, I'm like, does it fucking matter? Um, what do you think when you see that, Greg? Uh, well, I do my best to not look at Instagram. <laughs> and but so my, my initial reaction if I see that is I move on with my life and don't give a shit. So you were thinking, so is that I, I don't, Why would I care if someone made a power snatch or a power clean or not? It's not my athlete. 
And also, to me, <laughs> honestly, nine times out of 10, and that's being generous, that kind of a post is like, oh, I know this wasn't power. I know it really doesn't count as a power, even by my own definition, but I wanna show everybody how close it was so they know how good I am. It's like, it's the uh, kind of more technical equivalent of a, a butt crack shot. <laughs> okay, that's not where I was hoping that would go. Um, hey, you know what? You my surprised. unpredictability is what you love about me. <laughs> So my question then became, um, what what's the what's the purpose then of a power snatch, and does it matter if you actually catch it as a power snatch or not? Like, <laughs> nah. Why, why just, <laughs> nah. Okay, Are you asking me that question? No, I'm asking the audience who can't answer. Okay, well, let's give them a second to think about it before they respond. <laughs> you ask the question, and then there's just dead silence. <laughs> I'm depending on you. Okay. Well, in my opinion, yes, it matters to an extent, but not usually for the reason people think it matters. Um, it, you do power snatches and power cleans for specific reasons those reasons are not always the same for every lifter and every part of the program and every day you use them um, but you have there's a reason you make that distinction and that is if it is a you are able to pull turn over and receive a lift above a certain height most coaches I say would would make that delineation above a parallel squat which never made sense to me why not call it a horizontal squat but anyway um, then you are demonstrating that with that weight, you were able to uh, execute it with a certain amount of speed and aggression, timing, whatever. Okay, so there, that's kind of the point. And then you, you develop those characteristics that can then carry over into a snatch and a clean. Um, when you start getting into weights that are really borderline, you start losing a lot of the uh, characteristics of that lift that you're actually looking for that are beneficial for you. Um, the lift starts slowing down a little bit. You start being more concerned about finding ways to accordion your body under the bar to get your butt above your knees. Uh, you know, with the, the power snatch in particular, I wrote an entire article about this, basically just being a dick, uh, that a lot of times those power snatches are not helping you. They're counterproductive because you're sticking your butt so far back, you're leaning your chest so far forward and then pulling the bar so far back behind your head just to say, yeah, it's above a parallel squat, it's a power snatch, look how good I am at this. But you're changing the motion so completely that it's not going to carry over into your snatches. And in fact, it's probably gonna harm them by creating habits that are gonna interfere with the way that you want to be moving in the snatch. So if, if your power stuff is that borderline, unless for some reason your only goal with it is to see how much you can power snatch or power clean, which can be an interesting, fun endeavor. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, then it, it's kind of, once you're at that point, it's sort of meaningless. And a, a, a number of um, former athletes that I've spoken to, uh, you know, one the first one that I really had a long conversation about with it was a guy who came up in the East German sports school system as a weightlifter. Uh, he went, you know, from a, a youth and a junior lifter and he retired when he was 20. But they for them, a power... Uh, snatch or a clean was a 90 degree knee angle which is considerably above parallel um, and so it kind of goes to show you that what they were looking for was more that um, that effort to really accelerate and change directions and pull under and secure that bar overhead as quickly as possible versus it being about some arbitrary height of a, a squat did that even answer your question? That sounded really incoherent yeah, no, to me. No, no, no. Um, I, you know, as I'm, as I think about it, I mean, the key thing is that <clears throat> you don't change your mechanics to try to execute it. So then, then the question is that power or or not doesn't really matter. As long, I mean, as long as you didn't change the mechanics, is and it's above where you normally snatch, then you you still derive some benefit because you pulled it higher than you normally pull it and you turned over sharp. Um, I get people who can't 
stop the bar. So they might get a higher pull out of it, um, but one of their problems is their inability to um, catch the bar tight. Then we have another problem that we need to start working on, right? So they're, they, they have the ability to pull to a height that's above parallel, but they, they turn over too slow. And so power centers can help them learn how to do that. If it then, when it's heavy, they per, turn over slower. You can imagine what happens when it's really heavy if they turn over slow. Now we need to do work on turning over faster. And if power snatch, which is one of the exercises that we use to help with that, isn't working, we need to start looking somewhere else to teach them how to turn over faster. Um, so you can kind of use it for that purpose, and then if you identify it as an exercise that is not working for them to do that, then we have to start looking elsewhere for exercises to teach them a, a faster turnover. Yeah. Um, I'm oh, sorry, I thought you were done with that. Well, you can... You can oh, I was just going to say that in in my experience, I, I have encountered more athletes who do better with alternative lifts to the power snatch than the power snatch. So the, the to me, the power clean is, is helpful and effective pretty much across the board, but the power snatch is not like that. The power snatch um, is more problematic for more lifters, and I find a lot more... Um, value with alternatives like really high hang snatches, snatch from power position, dip snatch, snatch from really high blocks, those sorts of things where you're you're training that same, um, you know, super aggressive, quick sharp finish and and turnover, uh, but doing so in a way that is is more closely uh, mimicking the actual snatch. And it's not, there's less, so much less potential for changing the mechanics that you want to preserve. Right, right. So, I mean, at the end of the day, all we're really getting out of is a demonstration of the, of power, uh, of, of, of speed, um, where we get the bar higher. And if you're catching it below parallel, then you're, you're losing that. But as long as you don't change your mechanics, it, you're you're not harming anything and so then it's you know obviously it's a it's useful uh up until to that point so once you get below parallel um now you're just snatching and there's no harm in in power snatching to snatching but uh posting the video and asking everybody if it's a power snatch when you clearly know that it wasn't because you had to ask the question um like you <laughs> did said, i squat deep enough <laughs> yeah no just, obviously not you're like no, it was just almost a snatch. Um, so you're in that, you know, you were in snatch purgatory, uh, the in-between land between uh, a power snatch and a full snatch. Uh, so you were able to stop your snatch. That's what it was. Um, which is, oh my God, I swear, I, I swear, told Ray, you. I told you, I swear. Hold on. Ursula swore up and down that she turned the ringer off on her phone. I said I didn't believe her. Hello, <laughs> Ursula can't use a phone. I swear, I turned it down. This happened right before we got on air. Yeah, what? fire. <laughs> it's official. Uh, we need to just build you a soundproof booth somewhere in your house. With your computer outside of it, so the fan okay, noise doesn't get in there. After today, no phones I'm allowed. I'm going to take this phone out of. It's my office, Greg. I have I'm supposed to have a phone in it. You I don't can't even use, have a phone. I don't even you just use have to line. know how to turn it off. I tried. No, you didn't. I. I you know what? I remember, I remember when I told you what to do? Off, I Ursula, know. I, I, just unplug the phone. No, 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 no. I got it. I turned the ringer off. I totally turned the ringer off. Just unplug it. No, 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 no. I, t I totally turned the ringer off. I so turned, this is my life, guys. This is why we my, always I, I turned to the quit volume the down. I turned the volume down, but apparently it was just for that time. Uh huh. Do we have Sorry. any uh, landline phone technicians who can come give <laughs> Ursula a fucking seminar on how to use a phone? <laughs> I never answered. I never use it. I just or some kind of person who can just sit there and supervise her the whole time. I'm, I'm, okay. 
So now you're swearing that you never use it. So really, it, it, it exists I, only to destroy the integrity of this podcast, and you still won't unplug it or remove it from the room. Are you I trying need, to piss everybody off? I need it for my facts. Your facts? Holy shit, Ursula. 1989 just faxed you and said it needs a fax machine back. <laughs> Fucking you hell. You just never is, know. Is someone faxing you on your pager right now, too? <laughs> for the love of God. I lost my pager. Just get a smoke signal machine while you're at it. Get some fucking uh, flags. <laughs> Someone help me. Please. <laughs> I do know Morse code. Oh, fantastic. I know SOS too, and it's what I'm about to start fucking typing. <laughs> oh, uh, Greg. So now she's going to try to garner sympathy with a cough. Greg's it's so mean to me, he made me bitch. sick. I did, I, I've had the flu forever, and I might die. When I die, you're going to feel really guilty, because you're going to have to do the podcast with somebody else. <laughs> the final podcast episode will be Ursula's eulogy. <laughs> that's, that's sad and mean at the same time. You brought it up. I didn't come up with that idea. You basically just obligated me to do that. <laughs> Yeah, you're just going to Instead of saying, when I'm gone, you can find someone else and move on with this podcast. No, you you're can. like, nope, when I'm gone, you're shutting this fucking thing down. Yes, and you're going to have to say, I'm sorry for all the time. <laughs> We're going to miss her phone ringing. We're going to miss her dog barking. Yeah. We're going to miss the humming of her 1902 computer. We're going to miss her Morse code and her beeper going off. <laughs> We're going to miss Robin Goat's calls. We're going to miss... Derek Johnson's calls. We're going to miss. You have to do all the name dropping for me. <sighs> okay. Um, so, shady, shysty people, bad power. Check, statues. power, nah. All right. Okay. You want to do Courtney? Oh, sure. Why not? Yeah, Who knows Courtney's where this Tally, one's going to go? Greg, Steven. I don't know because I don't have my glasses and I can't see. And I'm not good at math. Days. I don't have my glasses on. Okay, Courtney says, hi guys, <laughs> please could you discuss this Instagram post? Um, and I'm just going to... You didn't look at Instagram, Greg. Huh? I, I, I thought don't... you said it like... Yeah. Oh, she made you. I look at it when someone asks me a question about something specific. Uh, let me just read the part of the caption that matters. Uh, the high hang snatch is the greatest indicator of Olympic weightlifting performance according to Chinese researchers because it best measures an athlete's ability to generate power with little momentum. As such, it is common for Chinese lifters to hang snatch about 10 to 20 kilos more than their max snatch on average. This helps ensure that athletes can have a power reserve after a heavy snatch or clean deadlift. And so basically, Courtney asks, uh, is there some truth to this? I don't understand why it would be true. Um, and Ursula, <laughs> and we started talking about this a little bit. And it, it seemed like it, on its face, we do kind of initially agree that this does not make sense. But... I'm going to venture uh, a few guesses on why this would largely be true for a group of people, say like Chinese weightlifters. Um, there's a few reasons. First and foremost, if this is a lift that they really, really emphasize and train a lot, then they're going to be very good at it. Um, if you had a lifter who snatches from the floor 95% of the time and does high hang snatches 5% of the time, guess what they're going to be better at? Um, if you do 50-50, all of a sudden those numbers are going to get closer and closer to each other. Um, there's also a number of other things. Uh, number one, you know, it, and this may not be true in all cases, but uh, if you are using straps from the high hang but not from the floor, that's a potential way to get your high hang snatch better than your max snatch from the floor. But the, I think the, the big one too is that um, he's saying that, okay, well, it's, it shows your ability to generate power with little momentum. That's true in a sense, but what you are getting um, is a huge um, boost of elasticity 
from that really rapid down and up, you know, stretch shortening cycle that you're getting mm-hmm. from the way you're doing hang. If you did a high hang from a dead stop, like you went down to the hang position, held it for five uh-huh. seconds, and then snatched it, you'd have very different results. Um, and so it's, I think it's not fair to say that there's uh, little momentum because there may be relatively little momentum, but you are replacing that momentum with that elastic rebound. So I, I think it's a pretty fair trade. Um, I mean, honestly, even watching the video that accompanies this post, you're also getting uh, a bit of a boost by literally bouncing the bar off your thighs slightly, which occurs in a different way when you're coming from the top down in a high hang snatch versus from the ground up. Um, And then finally, and I'm sure Ursula would agree with me, I I would argue that in most cases, um, if you can um, snatch more from some odd position than you can from the floor, there is something going wrong with your snatch from the floor that needs to be fixed, whether that's a strength issue or uh, a technique issue. Right. That's what we mo- I mean, that's what we see here when yeah. that when that happens. Um, I would also maybe make the point that when they're doing studies, they're doing studies with a selected group of athletes that have specifically been chosen for weightlifting that are extremely uh, uh, adept in terms of um, their power output. So they've selected people with specific muscle types. So you might expect that they have, um, they're really uh, capable in terms of power. and also that they have the kind of brachiomorph body type where they have a, a little bit longer torso, shorter arms, and their ability to get under the bar really fast, even with a really short pull, um, they, they can generate a lot of power. They, they, they're just at an advantage all around, and particularly in, in this type of emotion uh, that requires a lot of speed getting under the bar, um, they're gonna be Uh, particularly capable so I think they already have I mean you have to remember that in in their studies that they're studying their athletes that have been selected and recruited um, they're not studying a general population and how they respond to uh, to different exercises Um, well yeah they're they're studying like you said they're studying a population that is all trained to do that lift really well Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm Um, and so sometimes it's hard to take uh, the the science from um, from other countries and then do just an absolute direct application to what we're doing in the United States because we don't have the same recruitment and selection process and we're working with uh, athletes that are being selected from a general population and don't always fit exactly into their mold. Now what it has to do with biomechanics and understanding um, just general uh, terms of exercise science, there's something to it. But if you you know look at um, uh, athletes and they, they look similar across the board and their physiology is similar across the board, then you have a selected population. You don't really have a control population to see if these are absolute truths. Um, the one person that immediately came to mind when you started explaining this, because I didn't, I didn't really get to see the video. But anytime you're going to do, you're going down a little before you go up, you're going to do better. As a matter of fact, whenever I'm teaching my uh, athletes to do hang work, um, and they go down and they hang and then they stop, I'm like, no, if you want to hang more, go down and come right back up. Everybody knows that to be true. Yeah. And so if they're doing that uh, reversal of momentum, then of course they're going to get a stretch reflex and it's going to help them lift more and in even more than they do off the ground. I um, could at one point do more from both blocks and the hang than I could from the floor, but that wasn't because um, of some special ability uh, and, and because it should have been that way. It was because I was shitty off the floor. I had to learn to pull better off the floor. Um, and in, in any case, um, I'm not sure this is a bragging point that you want to be better from the hang or the hip or uh, a block um, because at the end of the day in competition, yeah. you're, you're snatching from the floor. Yeah. So it, it, even if it's true that you could generate more force by doing a reversal of 
of the position as well as, and utilizing the uh, stretch reflex and straps and having really short arms so that you can get and being really fast at dropping under um, that's great but the world record isn't broken with straps reversing the momentum and and um, in, in that setting it's it's broken from the floor and so um, you know it, it could all be true but I'm not sure that um, it's something to get hung up on or try to mimic well um, yeah and I, I think though you, you need to f- be proficient from the floor as well yeah and, and if they are and they practice this to work on power and speed as some sort of reserve it would be the same as us working on doing say um, uh, three front squats and a jerk to have some reserve for for the jerk right and I, I think though that the, the way this is set up is very odd because I really do like high hang snatches and snatches from various very high hang positions and blocks. I think they're extremely valuable. Um, and yes, f- for the most part, if you have someone who can snatch a lot of weight from a really high hang position, they're going to be good at snatching because they are generating, you know, that second pull. It means they're able to be extremely explosive and follow through on that pull properly and get under the bar really well. Um, so of course that would be an indicator of potential really good snatch performance, but then to, to turn that around and say, therefore it's common to hang snatch 10 to 20 kilos more than you snatch from the floor. That's, that is not a logical, um, statement there. It doesn't, they have nothing to do with each other. Um, so my, my takeaway would be, yeah, high hang snatches are really valuable most lifters should probably do them on a regular basis, but I wouldn't hang my hat on it as, you know, the most important thing to do and, and push it to the point where I can snatch more from the high hang than from the floor. It, it's, like Ursula said, it doesn't make any sense. Why would you continue pushing that so far past your snatch from the floor rather than, you know, using that to help bring up your snatch from the floor with a a closer relationship there. It it doesn't make sense to me. It makes more sense to me. uh, You know, I said, well, it helps ensure that athletes can have a power reserve after a heavy snatch or clean deadlift. Okay, well, why don't you work on getting that pull from the floor stronger (laughs) so it's not as fatiguing for the top of the lift when you have to be able to accelerate it more? You know, to me, it's just like, it's such a weird backward way to approach that problem, but the fuck do I know? I don't have any, you know, world champions and world record holders, and I'm also super. Well, uh, who, who, what, what, um, what was the source? It's it's a site's Chinese references. What were those Chinese references? I don't know. I mean, it depends on who they are. Who well, are I assume I assume it's it's much like the Soviet stuff. You got a bunch of sports scientists studying their collection of weightlifters, who, like you said, is a very homogenous population who have been specifically trained to exhibit the very things they're saying are important. So, I don't know. It's it's a little weird. I think it would be very interesting to repeat those studies with, um, you know, a population like U.S. weightlifters. Or, you know, across the board, around the world, you know, using people who train in totally different ways, not relying on the same exercises all the time. And I think you'd, you'd get results that painted a completely different picture. Mm-hmm. So distilled to its, its uh, essence, high hang snatches are awesome. You should probably do them, but don't lose your mind trying to high hang snatch 20 kilos more than you snatch. Right. I would try to high hang snatch, you know, what I snatch. I think that would be sufficient. Oh, I think that's more than sufficient. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, you would be trying to push it up there. Absolutely. And if you're weak off the floor and that's why you're so screwed up at the top and you can't accelerate enough, get stronger off the floor. Right. Get your squat up, get your pull weights up, more pulls off of risers. (laughs) pauses, you know, slow negatives, all that kind of stuff. You know, I would push high hang snatch if that's where I thought an athlete had a problem. Well, yeah, I, I, I do a lot. <laughs> I do a lot of, I do a lot of, uh, below the knee block work because most of my guys have issues in the transition from the floor. They're yeah. strong off the floor. 
they're strong after the after the mid thigh, but they have issues in transition. That's well, that, that's like the from. weakest point too on the back. Mm-hmm. I feel like that right below the knee, mm-hmm. you can crush people with weights that they can handle easily in in different positions. I think that's very underused. I I admittedly underuse that below the knee position. I think, especially yeah. from the hang, hang hang lifts below the knee, whether it's actual lifts or pulls, are awful. But they yeah, talk to my people. They hate shit. them. We yeah. do we do almost everything. I use above the knee a lot for beginners, just to teach how to stand into the hip, um, and then we go below the knee. Like once you're qualified, uh, you go below the knee. I probably need to put in more high hang stuff. The guys will be really happy that we had this conversation because I'll put in more <laughs> high hang stuff. We're probably closer to the competition where speed is more of the essence. Yeah. Well, and going back to the power snatch thing, I will use high hang snatches and, and similar things more than I'll use power snatches in those situations where we're looking for a lot of speed and stuff, especially close to a competition. Yeah. Well, and then because you're preserving the, the back. Right. Yeah, you're allowing recovery um, as you start reducing pulls. You can allow for recovery of the back. So it's just being being smart. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. Can we can we knock out this Sally question real quick? You think? Sure. All I right. I would. So. Sally no says. In, well, we'll just have to do it quickly. Uh, Sally says, in dealing with an athlete with long legs relative to torso, do you prioritize fixed back angle on the first pull by moving the bar further towards the toes in the starting position or keeping the bar close and starting with the bar closer midfoot and moving knees back inadvertently changing the back angle during the first pull? That was a hell of a sentence, Sally. I just realized that entire paragraph was one sentence. She's, yeah, she's after my heart. Here. One single uh, piece of punctuation until the end. I, I can just imagine not go Ursula English saying major. that. I can imagine uh, yeah, that's Ursula exactly saying how that in I'm right. Breath. And uh, Sally's after my heart. She just killed um, your English major heart, and uh, that's okay, Sally. I like you. It has nothing to do with my heart. It has to do with making sure people understand what you're saying. God forbid. God forbid you communicate. That's what we have you for. <laughs> well, then don't give me shit about it. Okay. You can't have it both ways. You can't okay. be like. You're a super useful, valuable person by knowing that stuff. Don't fucking tell us that stuff. <laughs> pick one. Either one is fine with me, but you got to pick okay, one. Okay, let's do a correction. Reread the sentence. <laughs> no. No. We're going to answer the damn question because Sally isn't asking for English okay. advice. Okay, she is. In dealing with an athlete with long legs relative to torso, period. No, not period. Comma, comma. <laughs> Do you prioritize fixed back angle in the first pull by moving the bar? She just needs commas, that's all. Yeah. Angle in the first pull by moving the bar further towards the toes in the starting position, comma, or by, she needed a word there, by keeping the bar close and starting with the bar closer midfoot. Well, period. two midfoot, that's just a oh. typo. No, not period. No, there's no periods. It's, it is Jesus. one sentence. Damn. It's a legitimate single sentence. You just need to take and a few breaths in there. And back inadvertently changing the back angle during the first pull. That is a hell of a sentence, Sally. Okay, so Sally, to answer your actual question, um, rather than lecture you on, on punctuation... Uh, we fixed it, Sally. Well, you're good. Fi- <laughs> you're all set. Uh, you're ready for that PhD in Harvard American Lit. Um when first of all don't put the bar over your midfoot that just that's not where the bar goes i don't give a shit how how tall you are unless you're really 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 short you're you're not going to have the bar over midfoot that's just kind of a confusing thing that's gotten out there um over the balls of your feet or the mtp joint as ursula likes to say although she says the whole thing which metatarsal phalangeal joint there you go um so in other words where your toes meet your your foot bones um, so if you're really, really long legged or really, really tall, you probably do have to move the bar a little bit farther forward, but don't move it farther Close. forward than the front of your toes. You know, keep it at least over your toes. It's going to come back pretty quickly right off the floor so you can get away with that and, and kind of have a better position, but definitely don't move the bar way back towards your midfoot 
um, because then you will be forced to shoot your butt way up in the air and leave your shoulders in the bar behind and end up in a goofy position. You could have just started in anyway uh, if you wanted to do the lift poorly. Um, I, I think the, the, the big thing you have to do too, and we talked about this an episode or two ago, I think, um, you have to kind of modify that starting position too to accommodate your proportions and in, in a case like this, what likely that's going to look like is a wider stance, um, likely toes turned out a little bit more, knees definitely out to the sides as far as they can go inside your arms. And what you're basically doing is, in, in effect, shortening your legs, right? You're, you're shortening the distance those legs cover horizontally, and you're making that shin angle uh, a little steeper. So it's your, you, you can get the bar moving up farther uh, before it would contact the shins so you don't have to get way the bar way far forward to start or you don't have to push your knees way farther back uh, in the start to clear a, a, a path for that bar and then uh, you know understanding that virtually every lifter no matter how they're built is going to have a little shift in, in back angle um, between the floor and you know past the knee that's fine that's not what we're concerned about what we're concerned about is an uncontrolled excessive tip um, and so the, the taller you are, the longer legged you are, the more of that tip you're very likely going to see. And it's a matter of doing only the absolute minimum, um, to, get, you know, get the bar past the knees without running into them. And I, I think that's usually much less than people imagine. And you, the, you know, doing partial pulls, you know, uh, as I call them segment pulls or pause pulls. So pulling... You know, setting that perfect start position, pulling and holding one inch off the floor, then pulling to the knee and holding there, then pulling to mid thigh and holding there, and really reinforcing and finding those positions and strengthening them so that you don't just tip over it um, because you're you're blasting off the floor and and then allowing kind of the the natural mechanics to dictate that your hips shoot up to open the knee joint more because your legs are too long to be strong at a small angle yet. Ursula, please bail me out on that because I just started got rambling it. at the end. No, I know. I think you got it. Um, yeah, I mean, you're, you're still going to set the bar um, over the metatarsal phalangeal joint, and then you have to press your shin towards the bar, which means you can't leave your, your hips up or your shin will be too far from the bar. You still have to sit in towards the bar with your knee closing your ankle angle. Um, otherwise, you're just your, your shin's going to be too perpendicular to the ground and you're going to roll the bar back and basically look like you're doing a, a deadlift. Um, and that's not what you're doing. You have to, it's, it's like the reverse of a squat. And when you squat, your knees go forward. And, and that's what we're, we're looking for. And you can't um, accommodate. What happens is that people that are tall don't want to squat down that low, but they have to. So you don't get to let them, of course, visually, their butt's going to look a little high just because of uh, the length of the leg, but the knee still has to go forward over the bar. And so they don't get to roll the bar back because they don't want to do that. Uh, so, uh, and in fact, when you look at uh, the literature, like in Kanievsky's writings, it says that for a taller lifter, it might be a little forward of the metatarsal phalangeal joint because of that tibia length. And the femur length, and I think Greg's suggestion to turn the toes out slightly to try to shorten the femur and tibia length um, helps so that you can stay closer to over the metatarsal phalangeal joint. It's with a, a, a brachiomorph, a shorter limb lifter, that you might see the bar come closer to the body um, or closer uh, over the, the metatarsals instead of over the metatarsal phalangeal joint, not with a, a longer limbed person. So you're going the wrong direction if you're trying to bring it closer to the person with a long, uh, a long, uh, legged person. So you're doing the opposite of uh, that would be the opposite of what you should be doing. Um, their hips are going to look high, even uh, with the bar out over uh, their their in, in metatarsophalangeal joint. It's easier for me to say the whole word than the acronym. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, if you were to say metatarsophalangeal joint, then MTP. You're totally correct. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just saying, just saying that. Instead Acronyms are so out, ridiculous. Instead of figuring so out which letters harder. to pull out. You know what the one acronym that always pissed me off was, or the abbreviation was GSW, when people are speaking. So, you know, gunshot wound, if you're writing a medical mm-hmm. report. If you're writing a report, it makes a lot of sense to write GSW, because that's less... There's fewer characters than gunshot wound. But if you're mm-hmm. speaking it out loud, GSW has more syllables than gunshot wound. It takes more time and it's more effort to say. It doesn't make any damn sense. But MTP wins either spoken or written language. Thank you, Greg. And that's all I've got. <laughs> For his last <laughs> grammatical correction. That's not a grammatical correction. That's just an observation. And it's all about efficiency, not grammar. Oh, whatever. Whatever. <laughs> all right, guys. Um, if you I, like the show or if you can tolerate it and you would like other people like, to hear it. Like is, it, like is a very, you know... <laughs> strong word in this case yeah we don't have high expectations for your response to these <laughs> we don't shows. expect anyone to really like the show <laughs> if you think it's okay and you would like other people to maybe listen to it and, and potentially think it's okay uh, <laughs> please post a review uh, on iTunes or Google Play or, or whatever platform you listen to this on it's it's on pretty much everything iTunes, Google Play uh, iHeartRadio, YouTube Stitcher, there's a bunch of other ones that I don't, I don't even know of. People are like, oh, your podcast is on this. I'm like, cool, I've never heard of that, but enjoy. Um, we would really appreciate that. Again, if you have questions, catalystathletics.com slash podcast. There's a little form there for you to submit a question, so it actually comes straight to me, and I can uh, organize it in my giant collection of questions. Um, and I think that's it. Anything else you need to mention? No, but I'm glad we got another one in. Yeah. I miss you, I miss you Greg. No, I'm gonna come stop s- it. <laughs> I'm going to come see you soon. Is my little house ready? Uh, almost. Okay. It'll, I'm moving in soon. By the and time then these, you actually get these, around to visiting, it will be. Okay. Since you've and been saying I'm, you're coming for a year. I'm waiting for the, my little house to be built. My little <laughs> house... On the prairie, well, in the middle of the rocks. Well, it's okay. Even if it's not ready, you can just camp out. We've got a big yard. Shut up. You can camp <laughs> out outside. in the, uh, the woodshed. What the fuck? Uh, I guess you, you can, can camp out in the garage. Yeah, you can sleep on a platform. <laughs> the rubber part is soft. I'll bring my sleeping bag. Yeah. Um, the rubber part, my ass. Um, no, I, I'm waiting for my little house to be ready because then I'm moving in and I'm never coming back to Texas. <laughs> Uh, you, do y'all have what do y'all's pot laws look like you can pretty much do whatever you want except be super high and drive oh who drives super high that would ruin it well you know sometimes you're high and you gotta get somewhere no you just get all your provisions beforehand <laughs> you're expecting a lot out of people who are super stoned no I'm, I'm a no. no I'm a planner <laughs> I, I can get all my stuff together before I get super high, but I can't schedule a podcast with Greg. Hey, get hey. out of here! I might start the the stoner session late, but but <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, I'll get there eventually. I'll have all my Frito pie provisions ready. <laughs> <laughs> Frito pie. <laughs> Oh, uh, right. damn. If you come visit, you better bring some of that shit. I know. You can't have any. Nope. Then I'll be like, coming. I'm making my my Frito pie over my campfire by myself. <laughs> Don't fuck me. All right. You're the, one, you're the one who put me out in the yard. It's, it'll be a, a good break for you. You got to reconnect with nature and calm down. Shit. That's you're getting all wound for. up like me. <laughs> And you and you live in nature. I don't know what you're. Probably, there's no if you, hope for if you. you com- if you combined our uh, blood pressures, they don't even have a number for that number. <laughs> We're dead. <laughs> they haven't discovered that that many We're zeros dead. yet. <laughs> uh, 
All but, right. Okay, guys, it's been sort of fun. Uh, possibly talk to you again sometime about two weeks from now. <laughs> if Ursula can get her shit together, just say it, Greg. Well, that's I mean, what, if I can I get thinking. Ursula's shit together, we'll record another one. Her shit all is right. all apart. We're going to try to get it together. <laughs> all right. All right, guys. See ya. All right, bye.